Good morning, and welcome to our service here, here this morning, both those who are physically present and those on live stream. Our service today is led by our own minister, the Reverend Dr. Stan Brown. If you've read your information sheet, you will see that uh, notices are now not taking place at this point in the service, but halfway through the service. Uh, so there is nothing really further for me to say at this point other than could we have a few moments of quiet before our service continues. Thank you. We join in our call to worship. God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. In the calendar of the Christian year, there's a rather obscure Sunday for Christ the King, the festival of Christ the King. It normally falls um, around the beginning of December, just before Advent, and we don't make anything of it at all. And I thought, let's transfer it to this weekend as an opportunity to think about Jesus as the King of Kings in this weekend when we celebrate the coronation. So our theme this morning is all about Christ the King of Kings. We sing together, King of Kings, Majesty. Let's be seated and continue with prayer. Lord Jesus, Master, Maker, Sustainer of the universe, we are here to worship and to praise you. You are Lord of all, and you are Lord of our lives. You, the Lord of all who scattered the stars across the heavens, knows each one of us by name. Our names are written on the palms of your hand, it says in the Bible. They are with you always. What a wonderful thing this is, and how we worship and adore you for it. That we who have but a little time to live on this earth, who come and go amongst countless millions and billions of other creatures, are known to you personally. Thank you, Lord. 
for the greatness of all that you are and do. Thank you that in all that greatness you come close to each of us and make yourself our friend. Offer yourself as a servant and give up your very life that we might be drawn closer to you and your Father. What wonder is this? What joy, what source, what cause for praise and adoration in your name. Amen. I wonder if we can have the slide up, please. I'm going to go over here, and you may not be able to see me not so well in the church. Kids, can I disturb what you're doing? And would you mind, can, I, can we come and get together? I've got something very small to show you. Unless we kind of get together, you're not going to be able to see it. But to come a bit nearer, I'll sit down at this level. I have brought some pennies with me. That's no big surprise, is it? We've all got pennies, except look how big they are. <laughs> the older ones know what we've got here. When I was about your age, with my brother, we started collecting pennies, and we tried to get one for each year. You know, coins have got the year on them. And that was quite a common thing to do in those days. Now, I didn't get them all. There's lots of gaps. But we found these recently. Because we're moving house this year, we went in the loft to sort out the old stuff. And I thought it was lost, and I found my penny collection. I was so pleased. And some of the coins we had then were very old. This is the oldest one, and this was made in 1864. We were still using these when I was little. And it shows, anybody know which queen is on that? It's not Queen Elizabeth, the one we remember. Victoria? It's Queen Victoria, and this is called a bun penny. Yes, all the people know what I'm talking about? Yes, they do. Because when Queen Victoria was a young woman, she had her hair in a bun. And as she got older, after her husband died, she wore the veil over her head and they made a new coin. And the old ones are called bun pennies. Well, I can tell you, I looked it up because I was curious. It's worth about a pound <laughs> because it's very worn. If it was good, it might be worth four pounds. Uh, they're very common. And then we got her son. So that's the present king's great great grandmother or great 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 I've lost count and we've got her son who was Edward the seventh got another one so that was made about 1900 gosh that's a long time ago isn't it and then we've got whoops his son who was George the fifth that was made in the first world war and then we've got the Queen's father Charles's grandfather who was George the fifth and then you'll recognise that one, though. She's a young woman there. That's from the 1960s. That's the last queen. Can you see? That's Queen Elizabeth. You recognise that one, don't you? Though we changed her picture as she got a little bit older, as you'd expect. She's quite a young woman on that picture there. Can you see? She looks much younger than we all remember her being as quite an old lady. And you can see them. I hope you can see them there. I took a picture and enhanced it as best I could. And, and can you see they go left, right, left, left, right? Yes? The way they're facing. Which way is Charles facing? Have anybody had a Charles coin yet? We've only had one. He's facing... He's facing left. And they're supposed to go left, right, left, right, left, right. But they don't. Can anybody guess why? There's one missing. Yes. And if I had an Edward VIII penny, I'd be a very wealthy man because there's only half a dozen. They made some. He was king for such a short period of time that he wasn't crowned, and they started getting ready to make the coins, and they had a little trial run, and then he went, and they melted them all down. And they found some in a box in an office in the Royal Mint, and that's about it. Uh, very, very occasionally, one of these trial run turns up, and it could be worth as much as a million pounds, <laughs> because they just don't exist for coin collectors. But actually, I looked, I, you know, I didn't know this. I looked it up this morning. Uh, he also was going to face left, which is wrong. And the reason is he was a very vain man and he thought it was his best side. <laughs> and he was quite a fashion. You know, there, was a lot, there were a lot of problems. Some, some people know the story. There were a lot of problems. He wasn't the right person for the job. Uh, but his brother, when he took over, put things back in order and said, no, it should have gone right, so I'll go left. We'll put, it, we'll put the order back. Because he was a very different man who was very dutiful and very traditional. So he put things back in the right order. So, uh, a little link there to uh, the story. 
uh, of our monarchy going back to Queen Victoria. And uh, a lot of people here will remember having pennies with Queen Victoria on, don't you? Yeah, they were common as much when I was a child. It's strange, isn't it? Hundred-year-old coins we were using, very worn out. Um, what I thought about that was we tell ourselves there's an unbroken line of kings and queens. It's all wonderful and perfect, and it's not. It's very messy. You can see the break in the line with there should be somebody facing right and they wanted to face left and then they disappeared altogether. It's all very, very messy. It's all part of our history. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about Jesus, the King of Kings, who stays the same forever. Unlike earthly monarchs who come and go and some are good at it and some are not so good at it. So have a root in the back of your drawer. See if you've got an old penny or maybe start collecting the new ones because I bet anything, pennies aren't going to be around for much longer. <laughs> They're worth nothing at all, are they now? So maybe start collecting them and see if you can get a penny collection going. Okay, well, what we're doing this morning, I'll come back over here, asking Pat to come and join us, um, because here on our communion table, to uh, mark the coronation, we have two new cushions to add to our church. Now, if you're not familiar with our collection of cushions, they're mainly in the gallery. There's a couple of hundred of them. Pat will tell you about it. And a little while ago, we thought, what could we do? It's fairly straightforward, but we'll mark, the, 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 mark this weekend with the coronation. And two cushions have been made, one representing the old queen, 70 years, and one to represent the coronation. And Pat will tell you about them and who made them. I'll get out of your way, Pat. Right. Well, it's amazing that it's over 30 years since we started making the cushions. Kathy over there, she and a number of friends started the Needle Crafters group in 1992. We've made over 260 cushions over basically about 12 years. One or two since then, but uh, we stopped then. At the time, we had pews downstairs, so the cushions were all spread out downstairs. Now, basically they're all up in the gallery, so if you want to go and have a look at the actual cushions, do go up in the gallery and have a look. We have a book over on the windowsill in the far corner, which shows all of the cushions and a little bit about why they were chosen and who designed them and so on. And Cathy keeps a, a gallery at the back um, cha a changing gallery every few months of people's particular favourites. But this, oh, the end of last year, somebody, Stan, came up with the idea that it might be nice to commemorate the life of the Queen, Queen Elizabeth, and the new King, to sort of finish off what he considers to be our heritage collection of cushions. And so, in the end, Cathy and I um, each chose a design. Um, Cathy's is a crown, <coughs> excuse me, a crown and the um, ER uh, cipher uh, celebrating 70 years for the Queen. And I found online the New King's cipher, which is the C and R for Charles Rex, and the three in the middle for Charles III, and the Tudor crown above it. And I've written at the side of each, one, uh, each side the accession on the 8th of September 2022, and on the right, coronation 6th of May 2023. So you know, I hope you like them. Um, another way of actually seeing some of the cushions is um, a YouTube film which uh, Stan and a number of other people put together with sort of words and music. Um, I recommend that as well. But do, you know, do have a look at the cushions. As I say, a lot of you won't know the history of them, but uh, go and have a look at the book and have a look upstairs. Thank you, Pat. Well done. Thank you to Pat. Thank you to Pat and thank you to Cathy. Uh, do have a look at the cushions upstairs. See if you can find Rupert the Bear, who used to be around these parts quite a lot. We're going to say uh, a little prayer 
just a dedication for the cushions and there's just a response line at the end. How blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and sustainer of the universe, before whom all rulers and authorities must bow. We dedicate these cushions in your name. May they ever remind us of the memory of your late servant Elizabeth and call us to pray for your servant Charles and all who have been entrusted with great responsibility. In the name of Christ the King, we pray. Amen. Now, we've got a great number of wonderful young people here with us today. We're going to say a little prayer of blessing for them so they can go on to their junior church as we sing the next song. So, a prayer for you, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father God, for bringing us together here as this family to worship you today. We pray for our generations as we continue to worship and learn about you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to uh, sing a, a hymn, a song, which is all about dedication and following. We're thinking about the king yesterday making his dedication to be a servant of the people. I, the Lord of sea and sky, I've heard my people cry.
Let's be seated, and we hear a reading from the prophet Daniel, a vision of God's majesty, of God as king and servant. The Old Testament reading is from Daniel, Chapter 7, verses 9 to 10, and followed by verses 13 to 14. As I looked, thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow. The hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Verse 13. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Thank you, Mike. As we hear that vision, strange and mysterious, from the prophet Daniel, one of the Hebrew prophets, the Jewish prophets, we sing a hymn based on an ancient Jewish blessing. The God of Abraham prays, who reigns enthroned above.
Let's be seated and we're going to hear our gospel reading. Remember, we're keeping that Sunday that marks Christ the King. So we had that vision of God in splendor and throned even more gloriously than any earthly king or emperor that we can imagine. And now we see and hear of Jesus as the humble and broken king who is a servant for all. Thank you, Mike. The Gospel reading is from John 18, verses 33 to 37. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summons Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Thank you, Mike. Well, despite not being a monarchist, I did watch it all yesterday. It was a wet day. <laughs> I thought the best bits was Claire Balding's commentary on the horses. I thought that was amazing. And the other best bit was when Charles arrived at the church and he said to a child that he'd come to serve and not be served. And you can see the resonance with some of the things we've heard in the Bible today, how Jesus shows a king who serves. It comes straight from there into our understanding even today of monarchy. But the whole thing has made me think about what it is to be a citizen, what it is to be part of a, a kingdom, a country which could be quite complicated for some people. I, earlier this week I was filling in online um, some wretched official form to do with being a trustee of another charity. Uh, and uh, one of the first things I had to put on the form is, uh, what's your nationality? And you know, you click and there's a drop down list comes, and you just go down to British and click it and move on, dead easy. And then it said, what's your mobile phone number? And I had to look it up because I can't remember that, of course. <laughs> that's, that's hopeless. But, you know, just a nuisance thing that you have to fill in. Uh, but for most people here, that's, that's quite easy. We were born in the UK and our parents are British citizens and that's it. And we've always been British citizens and we are wherever we go. Uh, for more and more people, it's actually quite complicated, isn't it? Uh, there are people who have moved to this country and become British citizens. And that's quite a difficult process. You have to be really committed to it if you want to become a British citizen. You know, there's an exam to pass, there's a test. Let me give you some sample questions, especially those of you like me who have always been British citizens. How many members of Parliament are there? Well done, you've got one. How many members of the Scottish Parliament are there? <laughs> we'll keep politics out of this. How many members of the Welsh Assembly are there? And these are typical of the kind of questions that you have to answer in your exam to become a British citizen. And those of us who uh, you know, always live with this, we don't have to think about things like that and we don't know the answers. There are some more important questions in there that people are asked to answer, but there are some quite trivial bits of knowledge they're asked to remember to become a British citizen. Uh, and then there are people that are living here who have a citizenship in another country, but they have permission to live in this country and to work in this country. Uh, and there are people who have come to this country who are still seeking formal permission to be here because they had to leave where they came from because of a very difficult situation and it's all very legally complicated and nobody's quite sure where they stand. And so it goes on. It's quite a complicated question for a lot of people to answer 
what is your citizenship? And those of us who've, for whom it's simple should be grateful for that, but bear in mind that for some other people it's a really very difficult question, a sensitive one. In our Bible reading today, our main Bible reading, the second one, uh, Jesus uh, has been arrested. It's part of the Easter story. He's on trial in front of Pontius Pilate, who is the Roman governor, the person who's actually really in charge of that place and that time. And there is an argument or a discussion going on about what kind of citizen Jesus is. Pilate's trying to work it out because he wants to know what to do with him. You see, Pilate is a Roman citizen. He's part of the Roman Empire that has gone out and conquered all sorts of places, including Israel. So he has the rights and privileges of a Roman citizen. Not everybody that lived in the empire was a citizen. Those who were had basic, what we would consider basic human rights. They couldn't be arrested without a proper trial. They couldn't be treated arbitrarily. They had a right to appeal to the emperor. They had a right to expect protection from the state. Just the things that we take for granted as citizens of a free country. But only a tiny number of people had those rights. But Pilate is a Roman citizen. And he has legions of soldiers that he can just snap his finger and whistle up whenever he wants. He's got all the hard power in this. So who is this Jesus? Because some people are saying he's a king. Is he a rival to the Roman emperor that Pontius Pilate serves? And then in the story we hear in the background there are the leaders of the local Jewish people. And they've got some power. They've got some power, but they can only use it if they're very careful, very, very careful of what the Roman governor is doing and what he wants. They can't afford to upset him, but they would love to be independent and to be a kingdom in their own right again. So we've got the Roman kingdom. We've got a Jewish kingdom that would love to come back, but at the moment is conquered and pushed down. So is Jesus a citizen of that? Does he want to be the king of the Jews and set up a new kingdom and kick out Pilate and his Roman king? Or is he something else? And when Pilate asks, he doesn't get a straight answer. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, you say so. So he pushes him and Jesus says, well, who told you this? Is it your idea or somebody else's idea? He doesn't give him a straight answer as to whose king he is or whose citizen he is. And in the end, Jesus starts talking about truth, and Father says, what's truth? <laughs> you know, nothing to me, I've got power. <laughs> Some people think he's really serious about asking about truth. I don't think he's at all, I think he's, what's that? I've got the soldiers, I've got the power. What's that got to do with it? I'm not interested in that. He's a, he's a military ruler. Oh, all these things are going on in that little conversation when Jesus is on trial and they're trying to work out, Pilate is trying to work out what to do with him in this circumstance and it all comes down to what kind of citizen is he? Who's his king or does he came to be a king? And then Jesus says, doesn't he, my kingdom is not of this world. If you want to call me a king, you can, but it's very different from your rule with your politics and your power and your soldiers it's actually something else my friends Jesus offers us something incredibly precious he offers us dual citizenship I don't think there's anybody here that's got a dual citizenship where you're a citizen of two countries at once it's quite possible but not that common but it's a very valuable thing if you have it it gives you an enormous freedom I, I know quite a few people have had two passports quite legitimately there are lots of circumstances in which you can have two passports so I had one friend when I was at Kingston University who was from America she's now a British citizen uh, but she had both a British and an American passport and I said well what do you which one do you use and she said it depends where I'm going <laughs> so, if I go to Israel, which she had, she's an Anglican priest now, uh, on pilgrimage, I always use the same passport because once it's got an Israel stamp in, there's some other countries that won't let you in. So I keep them separate, like that. And I used somebody else who was a colleague in the university who did research that took her abroad to places that can be quite dangerous. 
and she also had two passports because she was originally from Ireland. And quite a lot of people in the UK have a British and an Irish passport. That's quite common and entirely legitimate. It's totally above board. Uh, if you've got Irish heritage, that's quite possible to have a British and an Irish passport. And she said, I always travel on the Irish passport if we're going anywhere troublesome. Uh, because nobody dislikes the Irish, but because uh, they don't interfere anywhere in the world. <laughs> they mind their own business. Whereas Britain gets involved in international politics and there are places where British people are not as welcome. And she also said the Irish government gets you out better than the British government. Uh, and that actually happened to her. They, her and her colleagues were in the news at one point when they were in danger in a Middle Eastern country. And it was the Irish government that got them out, not ours, which is very interesting, I thought. So, dual citizenship really exists in this world as a practical thing for some people, and it has great benefits for those who enjoy it. Uh, Jesus says to us, yes, you are citizens of earthly kingdoms, and these kingdoms matter. In the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about government, not so much about what you might call politics. You can't read it and say, oh, this is what, exactly what we've got to do in 2023 in Britain. But it has a lot to say about government. Bad government gets a real slagging off in the Bible. Government that is not keeping the peace, not keeping the law, government that is corrupt, and above all, government that does not look after the weakest and most vulnerable citizens. It comes under God's condemnation. And where there is government that builds peace, that prospers law, that enables people to have full and free lives, and above all, which looks after the most vulnerable citizens. That gets God's approval in the Bible. So good government really does matter for Christians. It's important. We should work for it and strive for it and contribute to it in whatever way we can. But Jesus says, my kingdom, his kingdom, is not of this world. So yes, you are citizens of an earthly kingdom and be good citizens and build a good kingdom, it matters. It matters a lot. It matters in God's order for the world. It's part of what God seeks for us. But you are also citizens of another country, and that citizenship cannot be taken from you, can never leave you, and will carry with you beyond this life to another. You are already citizens of heaven, of another country. That's an amazing offer from Jesus, isn't it? I will make you citizens of God's kingdom, which is everywhere and always, and you will always be citizens of that kingdom, and you will always be under the guidance and the protection of God, and you will always forever be able to be citizens of that kingdom. Whatever happens to you here, whatever comes and goes with your earthly citizenship and all the problems there can be around it. That is his offer and gift to us. A challenge to be good citizens here and contribute to our society, and an offer and a gift that we are part of something so much bigger and deeper and wider, and that is for all people, whatever their race, whatever their color, whatever their time and generation, whatever their place. My kingdom is not of this world, says Jesus. It's much bigger than that. Amen. We sing together a song that's uh, quite a new song that not all may know quite so well. There is a higher throne all about that sense of belonging to another kingdom as well as this one.
prayer, our prayer of intercession, our prayer for our world around us, and especially, of course, today we pray for our own country. We've got a slide to come up. Thank you. That's just the response at the end of each section. Let's pray. Loving God, we pray for Charles and Camilla, whom we have entrusted with authority and influence. May the kingship of Christ guide them. We pray for those who are enabling their communities to celebrate this weekend and for those who join in acts of service tomorrow. May the kingship of Christ guide them. We pray for all who hold power that they may not manipulate the truth to retain their own ends. May the kingship of Christ guide them. We pray for those exploited or abused by those in positions of power. May the kingship of Christ guide them. We pray for those robbed of their freedom for challenging injustice. May the kingship of Christ guide them. We pray for our church that in confidence we would share your truth that we know and in humility seek out the truth we have yet to learn. May the kingship of Christ guide us. We pray for one another and ourselves that we would be open to truth and eager for wisdom. May the kingship of Christ guide us. Amen. And we say the Lord's Prayer together as we pray to our Father in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen so we're going to have our notices now the reason why we're experimenting with doing it a bit later in the service is because we seem to have more of a staggered start than we used to 
uh, at Serpenton Hill, and particularly people coming with young children can't always get here right at the start. So we, we don't all start very promptly, and we thought it would be easier if we put the notices in a little later in the service. Thanks, Mike. I don't really have very much to say, actually, it's <laughs> to, be, to be quite honest. But I will refer to next Sunday, because next Sunday is the beginning of Christian Aid Week. And uh, the uh, envelopes for those who wish to contribute to them um, uh, by way of donations to Christian Aid will be available that Sunday and um, the following Sunday for anybody who hasn't been able to contribute and wishes in, on, on the previous one. So it's the Sundays the 14th and the 21st of May. Uh, the envelopes for Christian Aid will be available. Um, I think this Friday evening, Catherine will um, advise me on this, but I think there is quite an important event going on at um, Claygate Village Hall, is there not? There is. So Catherine, you perhaps could shout out what it is. I don't know. Oh, she's not here. It's in the notices. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. I think that is all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And we receive our offering. Our offering is uh, given as people arrive in the church, so we simply bring forward our offering. But we're also saying thank you to God for all the gifts that we can't see, the gifts that aren't on the plate, all the things that are given. Thank you. Here, Lord, are just some of your people, some of your citizens, some of your family. You called us to be a people who are generous, to share the good things that we have, to enable your kingdom to be built, to enable our world to be changed and become more like the world that you call it to be. So we thank you for all the gifts that are represented here, the ones we can see and the ones we can't see. And we pray that we will use these good things in Jesus' name to build his kingdom in this place. Amen. <clears throat> Just a moment, our final hymn and then a prayer. Uh, please at the end of the service while we're having refreshments, come and have a closer look at the pew cushions or if you're not uh, familiar with what we've got uh, and you're not used to going upstairs have a, have a look upstairs you may be quite surprised at uh, some of the color and variety that there is up there and i've also put those those pennies on the tail if anybody wanted a closer look at those we sing together at the name of jesus every knee shall bow <laughs>
let's stay standing for our closing prayer. Look for truth in all places. Seek out the wise. Use your power to serve. And bring heaven to earth through your life, your words, and your prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.